So I'm going to start this video off by showing you this Popa Spurca twig mantis. And they are twig mimics. You can see it there on its back, playing dead. Silly little thing. It's very much alive and active. And they blend in perfectly with twigs. The species from Africa and it's been in the hobby for, I don't know, at least 15 years. Definitely one of my favorites. Well, we like to do this sometimes. I'll place it up here on my hat and uh, we'll see if it stays or not. I am going to begin answering the first group of questions that have come in for the question and answer contest. And I'm just going to check that my camera is on here. I get a little distracted about bugs. It's pretty much the story of my life. And so people check up on me sometimes and sometimes I remind myself to check up on myself. We've got 33 comments so far. Half of those I think are from me. And the first one was seven hours ago from Brian Meeks. And his question for the contest, remember we're going to pick a random, uh, use a random comment picker to pick the three winners. And it may take a video or two before I get through all the questions, depending on how many questions are asked between now, Friday, and Sunday night. Brian Meeks asks, if you could revive any prehistoric bug to take care of, which would you pick? And my go-to answer for this is always the giant dragonflies. I think Meganura is the genus of them. Um, I don't know a whole lot about them. Prehistoric bugs is certainly not my specialty, but it is a question that I've gotten before, and who doesn't love a dragonfly with a two-foot wingspan? I think 25 inches is what their wingspan was, and uh, the world was a different place back then. They didn't have predators, and um, it's possible that the greater levels of oxygen in the air um, supported them having larger bodies insects back then. Nobody really knows 100% for sure. There are some theories about all of that, but um, it would be amazing. It's, it's amazing enough to me, um, having grown up in Oregon, to find a praying mantis uh, that is this size or larger. By Oregon standards, that is a very large bug. And a dragonfly, there are numerous local species from damselflies to larger uh, darners, large dragonflies. And those are impressive bugs by Oregon standards too. So thank you for the question, Brian. I could it asked the next question, which tropical place or place in general would you like to visit just to explore and observe bugs in nature? I'd love to know from someone who knows a lot about bugs and enjoys nature. I, I've answered this question before. Um, I never mind answering the same questions over and over again. And sometimes my answers do change because I either learn something or experience something or uh, change my mind for one reason or another. But. Um, Ever since I read the Malay Archipelago book uh, by Alfred Russell Wallace, I've always wanted to make a tour of the islands that he visited down there between Indonesia um, and through to Papua New Guinea, Borneo, Sumatra, Java, all of those amazing places. The way he wrote about them is very dated now, but um, it is just so inspiring to read about someone coming into a place because this is what I do even in my own backyard. I go out there and I look to see what's around and I find new things that I've never seen before. And to have uh, needed to get onto a boat and to sail from um, England down to these places, um, what an adventure that would be, and <laughs> an adventure I'm glad that in the modern age I don't have to take if I want to go somewhere like that to see the bugs. Um, and there are still many undiscovered species and places in this world, little pockets of habitats on mountains and in remote places where any of us could go and see species that um, are not known to science. 
So it was a wonderful uh, book and I highly recommend it to anybody who uh, likes to read travel adventures that are centered around bugs. Trace asks the next question. I'm curious to know how many types of arthropods you currently breed. Um, I don't know if sometimes when people ask questions, they, they, they're asking how many insects species do you have or arthropod species. He's specifically asking about breeding. Um, and regardless of what he meant by his question exactly, actually, I'm not sure that Trace is a male's name, so I apologize for that. But um, I don't know in either case. Uh, I don't intentionally breed a lot of things. Um, just by virtue of having males and females in a cage together, nature often runs its course. Um, in the case of mantises, I do keep them separated, like this one right here, the uh, African twig mantis. And so I will only put them together for purposes of breeding. And I do have two sub-adult males to go with this adult female. She's getting a little bit older now, and she recently laid an infertile egg case. And so hopefully these two sub-adult males mature, um, and then I can breed her. I'm hoping that that works out. Where did the mantis go? Oh, it's over here. The next question, uh, let's see if he was done. Raising multiple generations of anything is what interests me the most. You may have answered this somewhere before though. Um, yeah, I just don't have an answer to that question as far as what the number is. Um, and again, I rarely, with the majority of things I have, um, breeding is not necessarily the goal. Um, I have had my sales website up since 1997 for pet bugs. And so more often than not, I acquire things. I purchase them and then resell them. And that's typically the game is to uh, get them out to my customers as quickly as possible. And hope that they have a good experience with them and maybe breed them. And then maybe I will have the opportunity to purchase um, the bugs that they produce. Angela Jones comes in with the next question. She had some comments here that I replied to there in the chat window. Um, with the addition of my last three Blue Death Feening beetles, I'm getting lots of tiny larvae. I'm assuming at least two of my beetles in my tank are getting along quite well. Well, the truth is that more often than not, when you get the beetles, um, they are reproducing immediately, and the female will have already been fertilized by a male at some point in the past. Um, it's just the, the nature of uh, how the... Uh, sales and acquisition of the species go. Um, now, what to do with all the larvae? Should I remove them or just leave them? And should the substrate be changed more often as a result of them being in the tank? And really, um, that depends on what your goals are. Um, you will find that if you just leave them in the tank, they will more than likely disappear unless the substrate that you have in there with them has some composted materials in it or um, you're supplementing the substrate with some foods for the larvae to nibble on. The larvae are not particularly picky. And so um, if you're seeing larvae in there and you're seeing that they are putting on size, I would recommend that you just leave things how they are. Um, later, once the larvae get to about this length, you will want to move them out, separate them. Um, one other thing I should mention even before you get to that point is that if you are keeping the adults in the same tank, and your, your question uh, was speaking to this, you probably should move the adults out of that tank since the larvae are seeming to do well in there. There's a good chance that the adults might feed on the larvae or that um, the moisture that you're putting into the substrate uh, you know, it will promote the beetles to lay more and everything, but the larvae probably need just a little bit more moisture in their soil than the adults do. So, um, you, <laughs> I can feel it tickling my ear over here. Um, I would personally, if you really want to take good care of these larvae, uh, because the adults may feed on them, 
uh, remove the adult beetles and set up a new tank for them. That's my recommendation. And um, Russ on the Aquarimax YouTube channel, um, he is currently taking things to the next level. Once the larvae get to a larger size, um, you will want to incubate them somewhere north of 80, 85 degrees uh, and beyond to get the larvae to pupate properly. That is what has been determined to be the conventional method for properly pupating them. I will likely do a, a video on this someday, but I really don't need to because Russ is doing a fantastic job in documenting all of this. So check out his videos on Blue Death Mating Beetles on the Aquarimax channel. Um, he's, he's doing really well with that. Shay Cooper has the next question. If you could create a hybrid insect, which two or three would you decide to use? Um, you know, for me, nature is perfect just the way it is. I would never uh, want to change the way anything is. And even uh, taking it a little further, I'm a person who doesn't believe in, um, you know, uh, pulling a polyphemus moth from one side of the country and breeding it with a different population of polyphemus moths from the west versus the east, for example, putting them together. Um, and especially if the offspring were going to be released into one environment or the other, um, that would be sort of a crime against nature, in my opinion. Um, you know, we do enough as humans to impact and alter nature around us. And I have an enormous respect for the way things were before we started to change it all. And so I would never want to hybridize anything, but I think uh, the spirit of the question was written for uh, much different reasons um, and, and just for the sake of fun. And so um, in that light, I would want something that was flying, and I do love, if I uh, am watching anything fly, I do love watching dragonflies fly. I uh, love their uh, maneuverability in the air, and so that would probably be half of it. And then, um, while they are predatory, maybe I would like a mantis. Mantises are one of my favorite groups of insects. So maybe a dragonfly with raptorial forearms for catching prey. <laughs> that would be a cool bug. Um, Vasuki Nagaraj asks, should adult dynasties be kept away from feeding on solid fruits because of the possibility of digestive blockage? I would say in my experience, uh, that the two species of dynasties here in the United States, Dynasties Tidius and Dynasties Grantii, I wouldn't worry about the, the Grantii for sure because their lifespans are so short to begin with as adults. Um, you know, they might live for somewhere between two and six months as adults, six months being the absolute extreme and more likely for a female that was kept cooler. Um, and of course, the tidiest they can they can live somewhere in the upper range of that. You know, close four to six months is probably what you might expect from them. And if you're offering them an overwintering period, in particular, um, as far as the exotic dynasties, I I can't speak. I've not raised or worked with the exotic uh, beetle species, so I don't know. Um, whether they would get digestive blockage from eating solid fruits. I will say that in my experience, um, the beetles will, I have fed uh, the native dynasties, both apple and banana, peaches, pears, probably other fruits too. Um, it's really not necessary because you can very easily create a sugar water or a honey water or offer beetle jellies, mixtures of various sweet things. So it's, it's really um, an easy thing to avoid if you are concerned about risk of digestive blockage. I haven't done any reading on that. And so I don't personally think it's a concern. I've had, I've, uh, in many years ago, um, in various yards I've lived in, I've had apple trees and every fall I would harvest those apples or pick the fallen ones up or pick the ones off the tree that had little blemishes on them that didn't look edible to me. And I would feed them to my beetles. And uh, I've always had lots of success 
getting lots of eggs out of Dynasty's grantee eye. Um, so I don't think it's an issue. That's, that doesn't mean that it isn't an issue though. Um, Russell Anderson asks the next question, how do you think we in the insect hobby can use our insect keeping to help people who are afraid of or apathetic towards inverts to see their importance? Um, you know, that is, a, that is a battle or a calling that some people feel. I do not personally feel like I need to change the way people think about the world around them. I've never been on any kind of mission to try to uh, get people to think about the world in the way I do, unless they have come to me and they have said, you know, I want to work on this, or they have, through the course of me showing bugs to them, um, expressed an interest in overcoming some kind of fear or he said apathy that they have expressed a curiosity about them um, because bugs are all I really want to talk about in my interactions with human beings besides maybe food and drink <laughs> um, I'm always looking for the people who want to talk about these things who are curious about them um, but um, you know, trying to change people. I'm 45 years old now. I've, I've lived a few lives by this point. I've had a few marriages. Um, I'm not in a place where I'm trying to change anybody's mind about anything. I look for like-minded people like my YouTube community. And um, I just wanna spend time with those kinds of people. And in the modern era, because of social networking, uh, social media, we don't have to look too hard to find people who like what we like anymore. And so um, my, uh, my vibe is that, you know, why try to change anyone? Why try to force anybody into being somebody who they are not? Um, so that would be my advice to you uh, is, uh, you know, you, you're, you're talking about the environment a little bit here too, I think, um, wanting people to see the importance of inverts. Um, but, but almost again, you know, I mean, just, um, you know, it's, it's the man in the mirror. Just, just, just be the change. Just be the person that you want to be and lead by example. And, um, the, the people that your, um, your mission resonates with will come along with you. Um, and, uh, the rest of them are just gonna, gonna do what they're going to do. So, um, be yourself, um, share your passion, talk about the things that interest you with the people around you, and just see what happens. Let them be them, you be you. That's my advice. A quad insect says, question, but what's your stance on handling invertebrates such as teas or scorps? Teas are tarantulas, for those of you who aren't familiar with the terminology. I know that it is a highly controversial topic amongst the arachnoboard forums, so I always wanted to know your stance on it. Um, it's sort of similar to uh, the last question I just answered. Um, people decide for themselves how they're going to interact with their pets. Um, hopefully they have educated themselves on the risks and concerns with handling certain kinds of things like tarantulas. Some species are more or less venomous, some species are more or less aggressive, and some people are more or less careful, and some people are more or less educated about how tarantulas behave in the cage or outside of the cage or in nature. So. Um, in my opinion, a tarantula is always a wild animal. A mantis is always a wild animal. I don't see so much evidence that um, this mantis in my hand has been tamed or, um, you know, it's, it's not any different than it would be in the wild if I were to set it outside on a stick. It would do the same thing outside that it's doing in here. Now, it doesn't perceive me as a threat um, but if I were to come at it and do something that a predator would do, um, it would react in a way as to defend itself. And if a fly were to come and land on my finger, it would grab the fly because it, this, this is a wild animal. Um, despite having been uh, bred and raised in captivity. 
And so as far as handling uh, tarantulas um, and scorpions, um, I never advocate that anybody handles anything that they don't feel comfortable handling. Um, and especially if it's something venomous, um, a venom with a medical significance. If it can send you to the doctor, put you in the hospital, it really seems kind of pointless to me. Now, I've seen many people handle everything from black widows to brown recluses to dangerous scorpions to uh, tarantulas that can, you know, be on the other side of the room in the blink of an eye and are quite venomous, uh, centipedes, all sorts of things. And um, uh, lots of inexperienced people and lots of experienced people. Um, I myself, because my hands are so important to me, because I have so many things to do all of the time, I don't take chances like that. Um, I see tons and tons of bugs come through here, and I rarely handle anything that's capable of biting and uh, not just leaving a mark, but inflicting some kind of um, post-bite suffering to me just because I, I I'm a productive person and I have lots of things to do and I don't want to deal with that. So um, just to touch on one more thing, you know, some people might be against uh, the ethics. They might have ethical concerns about handling tarantulas um, or mantises, things like that. Um, you know, for me, a pet is meant to be enjoyed. And if handling your Mexican red knee tarantula is going to um, give you pleasure, um, you know, I personally don't have any problem with that. I, uh, I love my pets, I love my bugs, um, I like interacting with them, I like handling them, I like observing them close up. I don't think that I have some kind of special relationship with the mantis in my hand, but I am fascinated by bugs. I always have been, I always will be, and I like to have them in my house because I can't always go outside and find something this cool. So that sort of sums up how I feel about the topic in general. And I'm going to take a break here and then we'll get on to some more questions uh, later tonight or tomorrow. Thank you guys for watching this first set of clips and we'll get a different bug next time. Next question comes from Lois King who says, just what I needed today as we are still in the doldrums of winter here. I was wondering if you have found tarantulas in that area. Great video as always. And Lois was asking about whether I had found tarantulas down in the uh, area east of Yuma in California. And I have actually found a couple tarantulas there. Um, I don't know what species they were. They were definitely in the genus Aphinapelma, like the 30 or so tarantulas in the United States are. A lot of people don't know that there are about 30 different species of tarantulas that exist in the United States, mostly in southern states, mostly in western states. Um, but the ones that I found, I've only seen a few of them, and I find them in rocky outcrops in generally sandy areas, you can find some rocks, some large rocks, and by flipping those or turning them over, you can expose a lot of things that live out there under the cover of uh, uh, rocks and other sorts of ground debris in the desert. And um, they were small and they weren't particularly hairy. Um, I remember my first trip back into Arizona from the California side, driving through that area back in uh, the year 2000, I found a specimen and I ended up sending that off to a researcher because at the conclusion of my trip, I had posted some photos of it up on, it might have been the American Tarantula Society. It's been a very long time now, I don't remember, but um, I certainly posted pictures of it on my website and somebody said, well, that may be a new species. And so I sent it off to them and I never heard back from them. So perhaps I did uh, contribute a specimen. It was a scientist. Um, I don't remember who, uh, but perhaps I did contribute a new species. I have a friend down in Arizona named Aaron Chambers who has a tarantula named after him, which is a pretty cool thing. It's Athenapelma chambersi. 
Uh, the next question by an endless cold. Do you ever go out in search of specific species of bugs? And absolutely I do. I do that sometimes here in my own area. Um, if I know that there's something that somebody wants me to find for them, I will go out and look for it uh, based on my experience of having seen it in particular parts of the area I live in. One of the things that I'm going to be looking for here in the next few months are saw flies. I have a contact who studies them, um, a researcher, and I think it was about four years ago I had promised to send them some stone flies and they sent me a bunch of alcohol vials to drop specimens in. And I did collect some um, where I was living previously and uh, they're in my freezer down there somewhere. I have bug freezers in particular uh, and I need to send those old ones and I want to get a new batch of them for that researcher this year. Um, Another thing that I might be doing soon is making a trip down to California to look for the native pill millipede species that lives down there. And uh, that's something that I've long wanted to do. I don't know whether I will find any of them, but it's a good example of something that, you know, you, you sort of set a goal for a trip. and. Um, the anticipation, the research that goes into it first is quite fun, figuring out where you're going to go and all of the logistics of the trip, where you're going to stay. Um, I like food, and so I often like to look around for restaurants and areas I'm going to be as well. Um, I'll spend most of my time outdoors in nature, of course, but when you're traveling, um, eating out is one of the thrills of being away from home. Um, and so, in this case, the anticipation of just the opportunity to look for this species, whether I find it or not, is secondary to uh, the journey of going and looking for it. And so, yes, um, every time I am going somewhere to look for bugs, there's always a few what I call target species that I'm going to see, but bugs never disappoint. Even if you don't find what you were hoping to see, you see so many other things along the way. Uh, some of them things that you knew occurred in that area, and then lots of things that you had no idea occurred there. And sometimes it's the surprises more than what you were expecting to be that make the trip. Little Miss Bugs, a great YouTube username by the way, asks the next question. How do you get family members not to hate you and she put a little smiling face, because you like bugs, or think they're nasty. I am having a hard time getting them to even come over because my kids and I love bugs, spiders and mantises. It makes me cry. What would you do? Um, that's a really, really tricky question to answer. Um, you know, there, there are people, and, and everything has to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis as well. Um, I don't know you and um, your children. I don't know the family and the members that you're talking about who are afraid of bugs. There are, uh, you know, percentages uh, of the population who have phobic reactions to spiders in particular and can barely exist on the planet with them, let alone um, come into a place where spiders are on display um, or, you know, they, they are the kinds of people who think that uh, no living spider is a good spider. The only good spider is a dead spider. And so um, it's a shame when people feel that way about spiders, um, but not so much in my perspective because the, I feel bad for the spiders and their existence. I actually feel bad for the people who are so afraid of something that is so generally harmless. When you look at the thousands and thousands of species of spiders on this planet against the couple that might be dangerous to people, I mean, they are proportionately very few. And so when another human being has the perspective that spiders are all dangerous and that there are these ugly things that must be squashed and destroyed. Um, 
and they're going through their lives being afraid of them and it's affecting their ability to um, just enjoy going places and being with people that they love like you um, it's um, it's it's something that I have you know empathy or sympathy for um, that's what I try to keep in mind when they're having that experience and so um, really all you can do in these situations and again it's helpful to have more information and to know the people and that helps you to know how to approach them um, and to resolve uh, these kinds of situations but um, all you can do I think is to sit down and talk to them you know maybe just sit down directly have a face-to-face -face conversation with them if it's really causing you tears as you sit I don't know how serious you were um, or how much it bothers you but um, another thing that I just want to say real quick is that um, there are times I've met people who are lovers of bugs and I'm not saying you're this kind of person at all but there are people who try to force the bugs onto friends and family and um, if people are already a little bit opposed to the idea, sometimes having things sort of forced upon them will cause them to turn the other direction and flee um, and close their minds to something that, um, you know, even someone that they care about, uh, they can't, even, even if they love you so much, they can't quite get over the fact that, you know, you're trying too hard to change their minds and to get them to accept something that maybe they're, they have a phobic reaction to, or, um, you know. But the, 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 the phobic people are sort of a smaller subset. I think that uh, most people uh, are nature lovers. They will, if you ask them about nature, they'll at least say, well, I don't like nature in my home, but I do like nature out there, and I'm okay with it being out there. Um, but when it's in the home, they, it's sort of an off-limits kind of place for them. And I have known people in my life in the past who would not come over to my house. I didn't always know it at first, but over time it was made, I was made aware that, you know, my children's friends' parents wouldn't come over. Uh, one lady in particular never came in the house, and we didn't know for a decade or so that the reason she never stepped across the threshold of our door was because we lived in a house full of bugs and probably spiders in particular. And um, I don't know if you've noticed, I mean, you saw the little thing of shrimp I have. I don't have a single insect up here on this upper level of the home. And so nobody that came into the home would have any idea that I had that sort of thing here. But that doesn't stop people from having um, preconceptions about, uh, you know, what it's like to be in a house with people that have bugs as pets. And so all you can do really sit down with them, tell them how you feel, tell them, um, you know, what bugs mean to you, you know, let, let them, let them maybe connect and open their minds to why the bugs are important to you. And maybe they can be a little more supportive of it. You mentioned having children, you might perhaps, um, you know, express to them that your children's curiosity in the insects is a beautiful thing to you because it makes them want to learn about things and to educate themselves. They ask questions about something in the world of science and it helps them to appreciate uh, nature. And those are really basic concepts that a lot of people in families can um, start to wrap their minds around a little bit when you're talking about the children and what it means to them and how it's uh, helping them to become better people. So uh, I guess we'll leave it there and uh, move on to the next question. Madison Jones says, great video, Peter. What is a species you would love to find but haven't found yet? Um, you know, there are lots and lots of uh, species of arthropods, bugs, that I would like to find. Um, you know, I can, I can go on Bug Guide, I can go in every county that's listed on Bug Guide, every county in the United States, and there's something there that I would love to see. It would make a fantastic target for actually going to that place. Um, one here in my state of Oregon that I found last year for the first time ever was the Great Grig. 
a very large orthopteran, um, not a cricket, uh, not a uh, cockroach. It's more like a cricket, but uh, I said cockroach, but I meant a, a house cricket, not a Katie did. Um, anyway, it's called the Great Grid, and it's just this big, giant, um, looks like a cricket, uh, like a, a Jerusalem cricket, if, for those of you who are familiar with them. And I had never seen one before, and I went 40 years of my life of, um, you know, I didn't know about them my whole life, but ever since I found out about them many years ago, and I saw my first Grig, not the Great Grig that occurs here in Oregon, but out in uh, Montana, I saw something called the Sagebrush Grig, and I posted a photo of it to Bug Guide, I don't know, maybe eight years ago. And, uh, and you know, having found that one, and I think I did look for them intentionally when I was on that trip, I knew they occurred there, and I went to look for them, um, and it was just in a hotel parking lot because I was coming back from um, visiting family over in South Dakota. And uh, it was in West Yellowstone, Montana, as I recall. And uh, just went out into the hotel. I could hear them making their little chirping noises. Um, and I just got closer and closer to those noises. And there, there they were, this, this mythical, almost mythical animal that I'd always wanted to see. And, um, and then last year, Jesse uh, from Shapes in Nature, who's sponsoring this contest, as well as Jessica from the PDX Insectarium, who was also donating. Here's those two prizes that we talked about before, the cicada sticker and the coloring and activity book. Those are their products. Um, we went and we found our first Greg, and in the IGTV section of my Instagram account, which is called at Bugs and Cyberspace, you can see that five or so minute, maybe it was 12 minute, I don't know, video of us encountering our first great rig. And so um, that's an example of something that I always wanted to find that I did find. Uh, next thing on our list that we're all hoping to see um, is, uh, in, in terms of nearby bugs that live here in Oregon, is a harvestman, which are another, another word for daddy long legs for some people. Um, and it's called Cryptomaster Behemoth, and there's another called Cryptomaster uh, Leviathan. Two very cool names for two very cool bugs, and, um, you know, we're, we just want to go and see them, and it just so happens that we're only hours away from an area where they are known to occur, so that would be the next thing that's on our list. Um, I could keep going and talking about lots of other things that fall into this category, but we'll move on in the interest of time. Nature in a Bottle says, Hi, Bugs in Cyberspace. How have you been? I wanted to start breeding my mantises, but I have a few questions. One is pretty dumb, and I might already know the answer, but do the mantises need to not be related? Um, that's not a dumb question at all. In fact, um, in many animal hobbies, uh, and uh, in some cases with uh, bugs, uh, inbreeding does become an issue because uh, when you con continually um, breed offspring, you know, brother, sister uh, from the same parents, and generation after generation, what happens is, is a genetic bottleneck. And so the diversity of genes gets very, very narrow over time, and that can make the population more susceptible to problems because they're sort of genetically identical. So a virus or a bacterial, uh, something like that comes into your culture and um, you know there's no genetic variation. It can knock down your entire culture. Um, what most people are talking about though are uh, whether uh, it affects whether uh, the specimens in your collection can breed or not and over time, over many generations. Um, as far as I know, this is not something that people have to worry about with insects. Uh, one, maybe one of the best examples is with fruit flies. Um, you know, people have been raising, and me in particular, I have been raising the same uh, uh, Drosophila uh, melanogaster and Drosophila um, heidi fruit flies for, I don't even know, for years and years, and they reproduce a new generation of flies about every week. And so uh, mine are all genetically similar and it doesn't affect whatsoever 
how many slides are reproduced in the next generation. And um, I have people, I have heard people express concerns about that with breeding mantises, which was your example. And um, I sort of don't believe it to be true that it's a problem. I think what tends to happen over time uh, is that people, they aren't as excited, they don't provide the same level of care a few generations down the line that they did when they first got the mantises and they were super excited about them. Um, or they leave themselves in the end with too few, you know, where you might start out with 10 as a breeding group originally, or more often you just got lucky with one male and one female and were able to reproduce them. And then in the second generation, you retained more, you started out with more. And so you did pretty well with that second generation too, because you had a bunch of uh, males and females that you grew up to maturity. And then maybe in that third generation or fourth generation, you weren't as thrilled and ex as excited about these pets um, and breeding them, or maybe you had hoped to make a bunch of money on them, but um, you found it difficult to find places to sell them or whatever, and so the wind was sort of taken out of your sails and you didn't do as well um, in caring for them or putting the time into breeding them in subsequent generations as you originally did. And so I think more often than not with mantises, it's more to do with what I just explained than with any uh, problems in their genetics and the males and the females not being as interested in each other because they're siblings. Um, but, you know, I, I have known scientists who, um, you know, they've done research on these kinds of things and they believed differently than what I believe based on experience and based on their breeding trials. So it's hard to argue with scientists who have numbers and, um, you know, write their studies out and everything. But I, I take a lot of convincing. Um, it's not so much that I, I have a skeptical nature I just have a really open mind <laughs> is, is what I tell myself anyway. So, uh, and then there was a second question here. And two, in your opinion, what mantises do you enjoy breeding and why? Um, you know, I enjoy breeding any male and female adult mantis that I end up with. Um, sometimes I, uh, a mantis will mismolt and lose a leg or something and it will happen with a couple of them in a large group that I start off with and um, you know where I will sell the majority of the ones that I had I will have a few missing legs and so I'll keep them and then you know it takes a few molts and they get kind of big and I'm like well I'm almost to maturity with these mantises anyway I might as well keep them at this point and then I can document through videos like this um, you know, their life cycle a little bit and what they look like as adults. There are many species within the mantis hobby that I have never personally seen as adults because I tend to acquire nymphs and then I resell them back out to other keepers. And so uh, one in particular, uh, Deriplatus truncata, a dead leaf mantis, I've never seen adults of that species personally. That's not true actually. I saw an adult at a reptile show here in Portland one time. So, but I have never under my own care uh, seen an adult of that species. And so that's one species that I'm working with right now. I have a small group of them that I'm raising to maturity and hoping to breed soon. Um, I will mention the ghost mantises here. They're available on the website right now. They are a wonderful species for breeding because uh, they are the most communal communal of all mantises. You can keep the males and females together from the time they're nymphs and grow them up to adults. With minimal cannibalism, you may still see cannibalism. Somebody on Instagram just told me a few minutes ago through DM, direct message, that they put their new deadly, their new ghost mantis, a smaller one, in with I think an older one, a nymph. They were both immatures, but this one had been living alone in its cage and the new one they just got from me, they put it in there. And I think they said something about it was starting to molt the younger one and the older one came along. Not, you know, they weren't tank mates for more than 24 hours 
and maybe that's the reason why it came along and ate the smaller one. And so they were upset, and um, it's always upsetting to see that sort of thing happen. But uh, so those those are those are a few of the mantises that I am looking forward to breeding or that I enjoy breeding. Um, next question from Serpents Tartan. Ooh, it's three fifty nine. The uh, South South Carolina. Uh, results are going to start coming in for the election. I'm quite curious. So I'm going to make this the last question for now, and then I'll come back a little bit later, and the sky will probably be a little darker out there when I do. Serpents Tartan, if you were able to see and interact with a live specimen of any prehistoric extinct invertebrate, what species would you choose? Um, this question was asked at the beginning of this contest once already. And so I'm going to stick with my first answer, which was Meganura, the giant two-foot wingspan dragonflies, and answer one other question real quick by Evan Bolko, Bolkow, I think, sorry, if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, Evan. Have you ever attempted rearing Tamimas? Oh, great question. You know what? I'm going to hold this question over, and this will be the first question I answer in the new set because I'll have something to show you guys and uh, we'll change the setting up here a little bit just to freshen the video up. Um, see you guys again soon. So I have a specimen container here that I keep in the freezer and inside of this there are tons of vials and I don't know miscellaneous things that I have acquired over the years and um, you know raised orchid mantises and they died and uh, there's a devil's flower nymph. I hold on to these things for various reasons. Um, these are Thibetica serotipes eggs that I froze many years ago. You never know when a researcher's gonna need one thing or another. I've got a variety of mantises in here. And again, these, these were all pets that died at one time or another. There's a ghost mantis. We just talked about those a few moments ago and uh, a spiny flower mantis that is a bit discolored there. But what I'm looking for in here is, is that one? No. Where are you? All right, so here are a couple specimens of Tamima. I haven't looked at these for, I don't even know how long, a really, really long time. These are the funny little stick insects that occur in Western North America, mainly Western coast states. And when they're alive, they tend to be brown or green, not this kind of brown. This, these specimens were actually green um, when I received them and then just through being in alcohol and stored in the freezer over time, they have discolored. But I do like to keep them around for cases like this where I have an opportunity to educate people about them a little bit, raise awareness about them. There's some that live here in Southern Oregon and I've long meant to go down there and check them out. Um, they look a little bit like earwigs when they are alive. I don't know if you can really see that here or not, but um, they are stick insects, walking sticks, some people also call them, and Phasmatodia is the name of the order that they are in, and that includes leaf insects also, like the famous Philium. And believe it or not, these are adult specimens of Tamima pretty sure. And one of the interesting things about them, um, I had read on their Wikipedia page shortly before running down here to get this specimen, that they are the oldest known example, um, dating over a million years for the case of parthenogenesis, which is something that many stick and leaf insects can do. It allows them to produce viable eggs, basically to reproduce without the aid of males. And so females of the species, they 
drop eggs into the soil. In the case of this species, they actually ingest soil particles, I guess, and they coat the eggs with them. In some places, you can actually find um, stick and leaf insects and start a culture of them simply by collecting the eggs that have fallen from the trees above. But in the case of these, the eggs are very cryptic and camouflage very well in the soil because they are covered with soil that the female has ingested and coated the egg with. So one of the interesting things about them. But for over a million years, um, this the, they are, out of any insects, they are the case example for how long parthenogenesis, parthenogenesis in insects has been around. Pretty neat little bugs. And I do hope to find them myself in the wild someday and to document them in a video as living specimens. Sorry to have to be able to show you only dead specimens, but it's neat when somebody mentions something very unusual, a kind of stick insect that there are actually quite a few different species of here in the United States, but that nobody, even stick insect keepers in many cases, even knows are here and exist. This is Blabrus giganteus, giant cave roach, one of the species that everybody in the hobby is always talking about. And a very large, long species, not the heaviest bodied roach in the hobby. Wide horn hissers and probably peppered roaches are heavier than these. I don't know how cooperative a mascot this roach is going to be for us during this video. <laughs> we'll just see how this goes. Hope it stays up there on my hat and doesn't crawl across my face too much. Um, so we talked about the Tamima and we're going on now to Jinja Charmander's question. Great video, love that drone footage and all the dunes and those crazy rocks. Um, cicada stickers, awesome. My question would be, if you didn't have to worry about import laws and about it becoming an invasive species, what international insect, gotta click the read more button, would you like to keep? Um, well, to be perfectly honest, I don't worry about import laws at all. And the reason for that is because I don't import anything and I don't really want or need anything from other places. There's a lot of stuff here um, that's being circulated around the U.S. hobby. Um, there's a lot of great species here in the United States that exist here just as natives. And then there's a lot that have been captive bred, like these giant cave roaches and like uh, hissing cockroaches. Well, there you are. And lots of mantises, some great millipedes. And I'm perfectly content. I keep my website um, well stocked, I would say, uh, comparatively, uh, with the things that are already here. Um, so that's, that's, just, that's just the truth. Um, I would like to uh, be able to keep and sell stick insects um, as far as things that um, could be considered uh, invasive. Now, the studies haven't really been done to determine on a species by species basis which stick insects could or couldn't establish here in the United States, particularly in Florida. Um, it is often said, stated, believed by hobbyists that philium, uh, the genus philium, leaf insects, none of them could live here in the United States. Um, and, you know, maybe in Florida, I don't really know, but uh, more than likely they wouldn't be able to live out in the wild. And so it would be wonderful if those were deregulated, but we just play by the rules. We uh, go with the flow on all of that and I never personally import or export anything. So um, if I were going to keep some of them, uh, the philium would probably be my top choice. I've raised six species of them in a previous life, as I always like to say, um, but it's been many years now since I've had them. Next question by Milo Kepler. 
I've got a question for you. What's your favorite type of beetle? My personal favorite is Dorcas alcides, and that's a stag beetle. And um, you know, I don't, I don't really have favorites. I've talked about these in prior question and answer contests. Someone else will ask a very similar question to this, and so I won't go on that. I will just simply say that there is only one insect that I have uh, tattooed on my body, and that is this Lucanus elephas, and that is my favorite beetle in terms of ones that I've decided to decorate my own body with. So I, I can't say something else would be my favorite beetle and then not have a tattoo of it, so I'm going to go with that as my favorite beetle. And oh, I have something cool to show you. Let's pause right here. There it is. Giant stag beetle, largest U.S. species, Lucanus elephas. Hard not to see this native U.S. beetle. I am sort of a beetle patriot and not allow it to be the favorite. Making sure I turn the camera back on there. If I can get this thing off of my hand, I'm just going to set it, you know, those little feet, grappling hooks. Got a lot going on on this hat right now. Did I get the beetle off? Not quite. They really, really dig in with those feet. Ooh. I'll just keep that up there for the remainder of this question and answer clip. Next question was, where is your dream place to search for bugs? Um, you know, the world's such a big place. I mentioned this in an earlier question, but uh, probably Borneo would be my top favorite place to look for bugs. Um, I would also like to go to Papua New Guinea, and um, I've always thought that nature there in general was really cool. Um, so those, those are probably uh, the two that I'd like to mention, although I could take the question in a different direction and talk about how happy I am to see you know, specific bugs in any place. And that's kind of what I want to do with my YouTube channel is to take you guys to lots of places looking for really cool things and to sort of feature what's unique about that area. In the video that you guys are asking questions about right now, I went down to the California deserts and, um, you know, there, it wasn't really bug season, so I wasn't really able to show you to showcase the diversity of insect species that occur in that area during the peak uh, months of the year for insect activity, but um, you can see from the video sort of the direction I want to take the channel in terms of, you know, showing the landscape, uh, going on a walk through that landscape, featuring the bugs, some other parts of nature like the rocks in that uh, example, um, the plants, um, and then down the road a little bit, um, I will probably expand the channel a little bit beyond that to include some other things about um, the areas and the people in the areas that we are visiting. So please look forward to that. Chelsea uh, Altrum asked a question. I became fascinated by invertebrates. I'm a biology teacher by trade with a background in microbiology. After starting an isopod colony in my classroom for an animal behavior lab about five years ago, the colony started from a mix of wild-caught isopods and ones from a biological supply company. About three years ago, we started seeing some really amazing changes in the colony. They no longer are as adverse to light, and they vary in color from the original dark gray to chocolate brown, tan, and transparent. Now every year, we do a mark recapture lab with them, calculating the total colony size and relative percentages of each color. They are great to show as a clear and simple example of evolution for my students. So here's my question. Have you ever kept any colonies of a species for a long time and observed any changes in their characteristics over the years? Um, the uh, 
the easy answer to that question is no, I have not. Um, it's never been my goal to keep things for so many generations like that and to call out individuals. It sounds like you're not really doing much to call out certain colors and then keep them together. You're just uh, documenting the rates of each color form um, and also light sensitivity um, from year to year. And that's really interesting. I think studies like this are always really interesting. Um, I, th I don't think that, uh, you know, you, you need to be in a university setting doing, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, graduate level work, um, writing, you know, these really elaborate papers to make things either interesting or informative. Um, the work that you're doing is just as interesting to me, if not more interesting, um, because I, I like to see how things look on the surface. Um, I don't always want, you know, the deep details that sort of takes away from me the experiences of observing insects and arthropods. That's what I like the most about just everything. I mean, that's what I do. I have the stag beetles. Um, I have, you know, they, they don't reproduce. Uh, the mantises don't reproduce quickly enough to be able to make those kinds of observations you're talking about. But isopods are a great um, example of a kind of organism that does. Um, there have been many other people in the hobby who keep smaller numbers of things than I do. My focus has always been on, you know, keeping as many things as possible or reasonable, um, you know, pushing myself to the limits in terms of the number of things I have, but not focusing too much on any one thing. Um, I have kept many colonies of isopods for many, many years, um, and but I've not seen them uh, change. I've not taken any measurements of the changes from year to year. And part of the reason for that is that I'm always, um, you know, pulling specimens out for sale. And <laughs> this guy's going to give me a little bit of a nibble here on my finger. Um, and then I, I might have new stock of those same ones coming in. And so it's not a controlled experiment in the same way that yours is. So um, I will say that, you know, Orrin McMonagall uh, has really been at the edge, the front line of the hobby all these years in terms of being the person who has been calling out particular color forms of things and reproducing them at scale. Um, the albino narcius millipedes are an example of that. Um, the uh, orange isopods that are in this, uh, in the U.S. hobby for many years are an example of that. Um, the yellow gyna lurida, um, that color form of the porcelain roach is a good example of that. Um, there are many examples of things that he has done um, through keeping these things for decades in some cases. And one of the great things about him is that he takes very careful notes, he documents everything. And it's because of those notes that he is able to publish in Vertebrates magazine, um, which we feature here as a prize um, regularly. And also uh, it's allowed him to write books um, where he can cite his own experiences with these animals, um, you know, through his own studies, studies uh, of the same caliber as the studies that you're doing, you know, at an observational level. Um, you know, we're not looking at DNA or um, you know, anything really super deep like that. And, uh, you know, as pet keepers, which I am, I would consider myself, you know, I cater to the pet hobby, the pet bug hobby. Um, you know, that's just a little bit too deep. I'm, I'm, I'm just superficial. I, I want to see what's going on out there. I want to bring a little bit of nature into my home and I want to make observations about it, um, but not necessarily at the depth that you do it in a classroom setting, an educational environment. That's a really interesting thing to do. And I think it's wonderful when um, teachers bring bugs into the classroom and even more wonderful when they have an ongoing project like this 
that goes on from year to year. So anyway, I just answer all these questions on the fly here and uh, we'll move on to the next one. Thank you for your question and your work, Chelsea, in the classroom there. Aiden Strulovich. Hey, Peter, I have been doing research on scorpions for a while now, and I think I've been interested in keeping some. I saw the selection you have on your website and was very impressed. What's this beetle doing? I really don't want its tarsi on my eyeball. <laughs> so I'm going to redirect it a little bit here. Come back up here. Oh, I got lucky. It's so easy. It's so difficult to get those things off your hands sometimes. Um, scorpions. Out of all the species you offer, which is your favorite and why? What is the scorpion you hope to get your hands on one day and maybe sell? Well, I don't sell any hot species like bark scorpions or death stalkers or the paraboothus. Um, I, I would love to be able to regularly feature the African flat rock scorpions in the genus Hedogenes on my website. Um, if I had to pick a favorite, it's probably those. I mentioned them actually in conjunction with that square rock I found in the video that you guys are um, commenting on right now. Um, not the video that you're watching right now, but the ones that I'm answering questions from the last video. And so, uh, of the ones that I have on my website, it's kind of funny, just sort of thinking about this right now, but um, the, uh, the Euroctonus mordax, the California forest scorpions, are my favorites. And they look with their fat claws um, and their tails not too thick. They look a little bit like the flat rock scorpions, now that I think about that. They're a browner species, darker in color than most of the desert species that I have on the website. <laughs> I'm surprised this beetle hasn't given me a pinch yet. Uh, I am a little worried about it. Let's move you back up here, buddy. Just a little twist there. Um, so yeah, that's, that's probably my favorite, just in terms of the way it looks. Um, if you're looking for something, uh, you know, that is highly defensive or aggressive. Um, the, uh, they call them the, uh, well, the, I call them Carolina scorpions, the Vajopus Carolin, carolinanus. Um, those, those are uh, just really snappy. I mean, you, you even take the lid off their cage and they will often start flinging their tail around trying to sting the air. <laughs> and so for personality, those ones are pretty sweet. Um, Next question, uh, he says, I have a two-part question by Phil Rupp. If you could supersize bugs to make them the size of a dog, one, which one would be the family pet and which one would guard the front gates? Um, family pet, uh, these, I don't have the imagination that I wish I had when I'm answering these questions. Um, a family pet, I mean, it's an easy go-to. I'm just going to say blue death veining beetle because they just have such a nice personality and they're very active and fun to watch. Um, they would be like turtles, uh, you know, you had a turtle living and walking around your house. Um, I would think it would be much like a blue death veining beetle. Um, and then uh, which one would guard the front gates uh, if I could supersize something to the size of a dog? Um, I mean, if you really needed a guard at the gates and you could supersize something, I mean, a jumping spider would be the ultimate uh, guard dog, I suppose. Guard dog spider, guard spider dog. <laughs> so, I mean, not, not, nothing would stand a chance. You, you would be very safe assuming that you were not yourself uh, on the menu for such a, such a thing. <laughs> Uh, next question, what is the largest live bug you've seen either in the wild or someone else's collection? Um, my mother and I raised when I was in my early 20s and still living at home with them. Um, a, let's see, it, it was about two feet long, a Fabetica serotipes. Oh, 
Um, I don't know if you guys will see this or not in the video because I haven't edited it yet, but when I was downstairs earlier um, showing you some Tamima, there was a case of Fabetica serotipes ova, the eggs from that species that I froze many years ago, probably after they failed to hatch for me. But my mother and I, uh, we raised uh, numerous specimens of that species, but they are now known, they were at the time, uh, considered to be the largest insect, in terms of length, species in the world at um, over 500 millimeters. Um, and now there are two that have, uh, I think it's Fabeticus kirby, 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 and then, uh, no, Fabeticus chani, or chani. Anyway, um, this, that, that is the longest insect that I've ever seen. Um, I have seen some, um, sometimes people will say the largest insect is not so much by length, but by weight. I've seen some giant specimens of Heteropteryx dilatata, um, the jungle nymph, uh, another kind of stick insect, and then also large beetles like uh, Chalcosoma atlas and uh, Goliath beetles and uh, Megasoma. Uh, probably the largest beetle I've ever seen was a, a Megasoma. Um, I think it was Mars or Actaeon, I can't remember. It was at a bug zoo up in Victoria, BC, Canada. So, what's the most inspiring story you've had? Like changing someone's opinion of bugs or just helping them get over any fears? Um, these are really hard questions for me to answer on the fly. Um, you know, I've, rather than talk about a specific example because that's just so difficult, um, I have sold bugs quite a few times to therapists who work with patients who have extreme phobias that debilitate them, that affect their lives to such a point that they can't live normal lives because they are constantly in fear of, uh, be it spiders or roaches or um, insects in general. And so they have worked, I have sold the bugs to them and they have, you know, through like exposure therapy or something, um, you know, try to desensitize people to, um, you know, the existence of these things in the world. And it's always kind of satisfying to, um, you know, be a vector for helping, um, you know, people in that way. Uh, but through having my website up now for about 23 years, um, it's really just the daily interaction between myself and other people, um, you know, all day, every day. I mean, from the minute I get up, 16 hours later when I go to bed, um, I'm interacting with people through Instagram and the direct message area, or through my account there, the posts I make, or through YouTube here, through emails, through forums. Um, it's just, it's, I just do it all day long and um, it's inspiring to me to know that I am helping people reach their bug goals, whatever those goals may be. And it's, I think, inspiring to them to have a resource, a dependable, consistent resource for so many years in me and my business for um, getting closer to some of these things on my hat <laughs> that you know, they may have read about or dreamed about, and uh, now there is a place to get them um, and someone who they can depend on to have those and, you know, new things on a regular basis, so. Next question from Luce. Peter, I really enjoyed this video for so many reasons. It's a mix of education, exploration, humor, and entertainment. I also always enjoy your pronunciation, pronunciation, <laughs> of words in Spanish, although algodones means cotton. I don't know if I'm saying it right. I guess it's a name that came from the human tribe that lived nearby. She's referring to the algodones dunes that were in the video that she's um, replying to here. I have to ask you, did you add some of your own water 
from your well to the wash. He says, water. LOL, I'm not a dude, but I would imagine being out there all by yourself, that would be an interesting thing to do. Um, if you know what I mean, oh gosh, doesn't food cooked outside nature taste a hundred times better? Okay, so she's, she's asking in a humorous and uh, slightly invasive and roundabout way, did I pee in the desert? Um, and uh, uh, my dad used to, when I was trying to memorize the capitals of the U.S. states, um, he would say, and, and you know, he was asking me, what, what's the capital of North Dakota? And then he would say, what do you do in a desert? And the answer was Pierre. <laughs> so that's, that's my limited answer to your question. Um, I, uh, I'll just leave it at that and leave the rest up to your imagination there, uh, Luz. Uh, September Blues with the next question. How awesome that you had the opportunity to visit with your parents and to bug hunt at the same time. Your videos always inspire me. I love collecting rocks myself. My question is this, given the give and take relationships that exist in nature and in life itself, what did you leave behind during your trip? It can be a physical, as physical as the rock you added to your collection or perhaps something intangible. Are there any areas that have restrictions on bug hunting and do you need a permit? Yes, there are uh, places where you can't collect anything, lots of them. You would need a permit in those cases to collect there. It's maybe a silly question, but I'm thinking of other hunting or fishing that require a permit. Thank you for your time. Um, so your other question was, uh, what did I leave? I, I, I took a rock from the trip. What did I leave behind during my trip? Um, Let's see, the give and take relationships that exist in nature and in life itself. What did you leave behind during your trip? Um, I don't know what I left behind, you know? I mean, in some sense, I went on a vacation and, um, you know, I took everything in my life down there, you know? There's not a lot of stress in my life but there is a general busyness and level of productivity that it is, and you know, people constantly asking me questions, which I enjoy, um, but when I get out of town and I get away from it all, and I'm all out there by myself in the middle of the desert, I'm away from all of that. Um, and um, so, you know, you could argue that, um, for the sake of answering a question that's kind of difficult on the fly, that I left some of my stress down there. I left some of the uh, baggage that I carry with me throughout the day, maybe. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's not really a great answer to the question, but, uh, you know, I, I, I take you guys with me on these places and that's something that I really enjoy doing. It gives me a purpose on that trip and um, you know, to have an audience um, who uh, is interested in the same things that you're interested in. It's um, something that I don't take for granted. It's something that I really appreciate. And, um, and part of the reason for that is, is uh, you guys uh, provide value to my life by giving me a sense of purpose. So I go out there doing the things that in previous years I've always done but I did for myself only. And now I have more reasons to go out there and do that. And so, um, you know, you, you asked a deep question and, um, you know, I would have to bend my mind and take a little bit more time to give it a proper answer that I would be satisfied with. But in this moment, um, I can't quite bring it together for you in the way that I might like to. Smocklers, who won the last contest, asks a new question question here for this contest. Um, he's uh, personally interested in geology and uh, enjoyed all the rocks in my video. Um, he says, if an insect beetle lover were visiting Portland, what are a couple must-see places to visit? Um, it depends on what time of year you come out this direction. If it's bug season, one of the places that I like to go is uh, Deschutes uh, State Park. Deschutes River State Park. Anyway, it's out past the Dalles in uh, a drier portion of the state. And um, 
I, I like going out there. I see lots of stone flies, which were the subject of my Instagram upload today. Um, and blister beetles, and we'll see toad bugs out there sometimes, which are these funny, comical, little centimeter long bugs that hang out around the sandy banks of uh, streams and rivers. And they look like little tiny toads with these big eyes up on top of their heads. And they just sit there um, and they, they feed kind of like mantises do in a way. They just kind of pounce on something and they have these sort of raptorial forelegs that they catch their prey with. And they're really fun to watch. Hey, if you like me, give me one of those thumbs up. And please subscribe and hit the little bell so you know when I post next. Please share me with your friends on social media. Thank you for watching.